in the lane, 15, 10, touchdown, Chargers! What's up, guys? Welcome into a bye week edition of Chargers Weekly. As always, joined by Matt Money Smith. Chargers even up their record two and two, entering the bye, beating the Raiders. Never easy money. Um, hey, we have a million. Oh, questions. that's right. It's uh, ma- we, we I, I didn't know if this was mailbag today. day or if next week was mailbag day because we won't have a game to talk about or how we were doing it. I forgot. So we got yes. Well, it's a good week to get all the questions, right? I mean, JC gets traded yesterday, so I'm sure there's a lot about that. Yeah, a lot of JC, a lot of Quentin, um, and a lot of other like just thoughtful questions Great. as the Chargers enter their bye and have Dallas and Kansas City out of the gate. Uh, but before we get into the mailbag, let's just rewind and, and talk about that Raiders game. Um, never easy. I, I did love your call uh, overall, and specifically the Jerry Tillery yeah. circled. And I, that was almost the moment where I think the, the switch went off for the Chargers. I think they scored they two did. touchdowns after that. Then it got interesting in the fourth. But um, what a weird game. It's always a weird game between the Raiders and Chargers. Yeah, I just couldn't move the football in the second half. You know, and DJ jinxed it because in the first half he said, I think we're going to get our first blowout money. And I was like, eh, hold your tongue. You know, let's let's just hold your tongue till the fourth quarter at least. <laughs> and for whatever reason, they well, not for whatever reason. You know, I think that first – the first drive set the tone, right? Cole gets this monster punt that pins him inside the, the five. And the first play is a negative two rush, you know, back to the three. And then you have a Quinton drop on third down that would have allowed you to move the sticks and, you know, get a little bit of breathing room and maybe you pick up where you leave off. And here's your middle eight, right? You score two touchdowns before the half. And now you get a third one here and you go up 31 to seven and then the game's over. But it's a three and out. And J.K. had some issues punting the ball uh, for whatever reason again, and I'm sure that's stuff they're going to work out, and, and they'll figure out. You know, I remember Don Mattingly, when we were talking to him once, had I, I can't remember what player we were talking about, but he just said, when you have someone that's done it for multiple seasons, it's there. You just have to find it. It's You just got to figure out where it is, and, and you don't get too worried about that. You know, slumps occur. And so, like, that's the thing with J.K. Yeah, they'll – Last year, he was the best punter in football. So they'll find it. So I'll just put that aside. But So that's kind of what the issue was, right? You look at the, the second half, Chris, and here it is. Three plays, 55 seconds. The interception was seven plays, three minutes. Punt, two minutes. Downs, 29 seconds. Those are their four possessions besides the end of the game, which yeah. was, you know, and I don't count that one because, again, I'm just talking about what led them to that point where – it's 24 to 17. So you're, you've got a defense out on the field for all but what, uh, one minute? That's four minutes, five, six minutes of the second half. All but six minutes of the second half, your defense is on the field. And that's how you get a blowout turn into a close game. A lot of injuries on the defensive side. So I, I give the secondary oh, they played credit great. for holding up, you know, Marlowe and, and, and Lane. And, um, uh, no Joey at Khalil was unbelievable I mean it, it, some of those sacks money it, it looked like vintage Khalil Mack um, Aiden O'Connell obviously his his first start so you know it, it's a little bit different from preseason yeah. right the, those numbers a liar. in preseason I say it all the time it's, it's it a is. liar it's just it's yeah. it's a liar like the idea that you're going to put any stock and we said this before the game you know when we were previewing it um, and and you know you never who knows you know a rookie could be great you know cj stroud has been great so it's it's not like it's not possible but the point i brought up was don't you remember the the zach wilson is a changed player and look at all that aaron Rodgers has done for him and and how great does he look in the preseason and it's like that's great and i hope it's you know i hope it works out for zach but i was like you can't can't say that zach is fixed from the preseason i mean it's just it's crazy so i think tip of the cap to brandon staley for just get, making things super muddy. You know, he's pretty much ru- rushing four the whole time. Occasionally he brought a fifth player, but rarely. He had, you know, Eric Hendricks was dropping a little bit deeper and in different spots at different times. And you could tell it just Aiden O'Connell didn't quite know what he was looking at. The safeties played great. And it's just that extra beat, right? That, that it's, it's all you need. It's like two tenths of a second difference from hold, you know, getting rid of the ball at 2.4. And now you're getting rid of the ball at 2.75. And that's, I think that's what O'Connell was clocking in at. And that's, that's all you need. 
Um, the the yeah. interesting thing for me, Chris, going back and watching every one of those sacks, and I went back and when I watched the sacks, I then went back and watched all of Thule's rushes. They were doubling Thule the whole time. Like it was, I think I counted, what was it? I think he had 37 pass rushes. On the 37, he was doubled 28 times, all but nine, and they were leaving Khalil single. It was just like, it was just the craziest thing, but I think it it speaks to how good thule has been. And it was just odd to see. It's like you would think after the third sack or the fourth sack that he would start sending help toward Khalil, but they're like, no, I'm just going to keep doubling this guy. And he kept wrecking it. The juxtaposition of, of Thule, and then I look at the top 10 pick for the Raiders, Wilson, who Keenan knocked no, on his great. butt. I mean, that was basically – Keenan's having an all-pro season, and if you put everything together as a blocker, as a receiver, as a quarterback for a play, um, you could tell that you know it, it wasn't a huge game for him through the uh, three catches, 32 yards, had that touchdown. Uh, but all the little things that Keenan yeah. does – I think kind of energized the offense. And I don't want to put a lot of stock into the, the whole Tillery thing, but, but buddy, I feel like there are plays throughout the course of a season where yeah. it's, it's good to see a team wake up a little bit. And, and I thought that that hit on Justin on the sideline, you see almost 52 dudes circle yeah. Jerry. And, and, I, and I feel like that is the type of play – that can kind of like show a bit of togetherness that, you know, sometimes when, when, when you're, you're losing close games and uh, the defense is giving up a bunch of points and the offense stalls out the end of games, you know, you wonder, is everybody on the same page? And I felt like that was a play that kind of illustrated like, hey, man, we got our quarterbacks back, uh, offense, defense, special teams, coaches, uh, staff members. Right. It was actually a, a pretty cool sight to see for me. Yeah, I think. Number one, the fact that Herbert just popped up like nothing happened. And he's like, yeah, whatever. I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I, I got I to gotta play to run. Let's go. Are we getting to the huddle or what are we doing? And I love that the first person in there was Scott Matlock, a, a rookie who's new to the team and yeah. no helmet on. And yet he's the first guy that's in there mixing it up. So that's a good, I love that Derwin's not even dressed and he's in the middle of it, grabbing Tillery by the face mask. Like that's, it's great to see, you know, and, and that's what happens. You rally around your captain and that's what Herbert is and, and he doesn't need it. <laughs> He's the biggest guy out there. So that's what's kind of funny about it is all these guys are coming in and they're 60 pounds lighter than, than Justin is and they're trying to mix it up. And it's um, it's great to see it. Like, I, you know, we, we know Tillery. We, we, we remember the Trey Pipkins play in, in practice. And it's just like that's who he is. And that's why he's not here. And, and it's, it's just stupid. It's, it's so dumb making a play like that where yeah. you could really hurt someone. And – you know, I, I had someone mention this, and it made sense. He's like, if you go back and you look at the Drew Bledsoe play where he got the punctured lung that led to Tom Brady getting that start, it's very similar. It is a very similar-looking play where Drew was pulling up, thinking, okay, I'm out of bounds, and sort of lets his guard up, and the D lineman just crushes him right in the side. And it broke a rib, and it punctured a lung, and, you know, changed the course of football perhaps forever. And that's kind of how big that hit was the difference is as as tall as drew is he doesn't have that kind of you know he doesn't have the the build that justin does you know the thickness to to be able to take those hits and that's you know that's what goes into drafting a quarterback you know and when people are saying well you know when they're when they're breaking down the stats or what kind of ball does he throw and so like people i think forget that the punishment that that position can take at times and how much of an advantage you have when you have someone like a Josh Allen or Justin Herbert back there that can take that sort of abuse and it doesn't affect them like it might somebody else. Yeah. Just an unnecessary That's hit. Stupid. And, you know, we don't need to belabor it, but it, it's it, it was it was good to see. I, I thought it was good to see uh, from a team building aspect. And uh, this buy comes at the right time, money. We have so many questions. The offense, to me, is going to have to figure some things out during the bye week. Hopefully you get Austin back. Not having Corey is a big deal. And, you know, obviously in the moment when Mike Williams goes down, you know it's a crushing blow. But to see how the offense looked Sunday without Mike Williams, man, it it's it's jarring to know that he's not going to be around. And they're going to have to make some some changes offensively in an effort to get the ball down the football field. Um, we have a lot of questions uh, as it pertains to Quentin Johnston. 
But let's just get into the the lead, I guess, of the week. And, and J.C. Jackson, who, who was active for the game Sunday, didn't play a snap, traded to the Patriots, essentially a pick swap. And J.C. is just out of the building now. So let's I, – I, I think almost like 20 to 30% of the questions were okay. about J.C., um, you had the you had the the sunk cost uh, analogy, and somebody had that question. So I thought that that'd be a great place to start okay. because you tweeted that yesterday, and somebody kind of wanted a little bit more insight. Yeah. On that. So the idea of sunk cost versus opportunity cost, right? It's an economics theory term. Sunk cost is what you've you've already spent, right? You've you've already spent this money. Um, your asset is not performing. So let's just say I buy a stock. I buy stock A. Stock A has now lost 40% of its value. I, I can't get over the fact that I have now lost 40% of my money. It's driving me crazy. And so I'm going to keep my asset in the hopes that it turns around. I get all of my original investment back and I turn a profit. Well, in the meantime, I could have taken that loss and I could have taken, let's just say it's $10,000, right? I could have taken that $6,000, I've lost four grand and invested it in a separate asset that will then grow. I take my loss, but I want that $6,000 somewhere else where it has the opportunity to turn a profit because it's not happening in asset A. So I need to move that six grand to asset B, take my loss, that's my sunk cost, the four grand is lost. Let's get that six grand working. In the case of JC, you gave him a five-year, $82.5 million deal. If he stays on the team or if you trade him, it's still gonna cost you 18 million bucks against the cap next year in dead money. There's no getting around that. If he stays on the team, you would have to renegotiate the deal, add years on the back end, probably give him a little bit more money to try to stretch it out to less than that. It's, it's not changing. That cost is sunk. You are giving that player 18 or 19 or 20, I don't know what the exact number is. I think it's like eight, almost 19 million bucks of your cap next year. Regardless, it's not working. He's a healthy scratch one week, and he's active and doesn't play a single snap the next. So let's move on. Your opportunity cost is JC is now not hanging over your head. You can add another corner to the roster. Maybe you trade for a corner. Maybe you like what you've seen from a practice squad player, and now they can be active on game day, and you can give them opportunities. And those opportunities could be more profitable for the team than the opportunities that were given to JC. And that's the idea behind it. And, and I commend Tom and, and, the, and John Spanos and the team for saying, okay, we lost a lot of money here. We, we wrote a check for whatever the signing bonus and guarantee was for these first two years that they're paying the most of, 40, 50 million bucks. But you chalk it up. And you, you chalk it up to a loss, and you appreciate that someone like Jossier is out there and Asante is out there and Mikey is, is out there, and those three corners combined are only costing you 12, 13 million bucks. So you made up for it. You know, it's, it's all – it's it's you can't get fixated on the sunk cost and hope that somehow you can get a return on that investment because it's not coming. And so I appreciated that they moved on from that. Now, will they trade for a corner? Nope. You know, sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, 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 no. I just uh, keep going. I just, Senor Snappy was the one who who uh, asked that question. Uh, the, the Chargers did sign former Bronco and I guess former Charger. He's saying Bassey yeah. from from. Uh, from Denver. So it, it just adds depth, yeah. but going back to what you're saying, do, do they trade for a corner? Uh, I mean, it's possible, right? You know, the, the deadline's coming up and teams, you know, would have certainly been very interesting if Denver were zero and four as they were getting blown out by the bears who couldn't close that thing out. You know, had they closed that out and, you know, fields doesn't fumble that ball. That's a scoop and score. And I think you, you end up at least even just punting that ball away and they probably win that game. And I think now you're talking about a fire sale there. You know, when, when you go through the, the standings, and so I'm going to just kind of get a look at them right now here, Chris. You know, when you, when you see, going to the bottom here, uh, you know, the Panthers are rebuilding. The Bears are, you know, that's the Chase Claypool that we talked about. You know, there's, like, it'll be interesting to see what the Raiders do with Devontae Adams. They've got a very soft stretch in their schedule coming up. Um, but I think you start looking at these teams toward the bottom, and I think it's worth asking, you know, if things continue to go bad, if they're one and five, if they're two and six when the deadline rolls around, there's going to be some players available. Um, and, 
you know, when, if you're the Broncos and it continues to go badly, you've got some really good players there. You know, Patrick Sertan, are, are you really going to give make him the highest paid corner in the league moving forward? Justin Simmons is one of the highest paid safeties. What are you going to do with Cortland Sutton, Jerry Chute? You know what I mean? The list goes on and, and on and on. So th- this is very interesting. I, uh, uh, last year, really, Randy Gregory was signed by the Broncos. Yeah. J.C. Jackson was signed by the Chargers. Chandler Jones was signed by the Raiders, all in an effort to, to dethrone Kansas right. City. All three of these guys get released within a week of each other in week four, week five. It's like, I mean, I, I think it's I'm almost speechless because those were the three right. biggest signings money and, in the AFC West last year, all gone. And I think it's a reminder. And, and when, when Tom Telesco says it, you know, Charger fans think, oh, the team is cheap. But it's a true point. There's a reason why guys are free agents. Nobody has a better evaluation of them than their current team. And so when a current team is willing to let go of an all-pro leading the league in interceptions corner like J.C. Jackson, and we know how important corners are to Bill Belichick, a secondary coach, that's what he does. You know, nobody knows secondary better than Bill, right? So when they let him go, you should say, eh, red flag. You know, when Randy Gregory, and I know the Gregory thing was weird with the Cowboys, right? They tried to re-sign him, and it just got weird in the the guarantees and the offsets, and it was the language that he got all upset about, which is why he ended up in Denver. But, you know, Chandler Jones was the straw that stirred the drink for the, for the Cardinals on defense, and they let him walk. So I think that's something to remember. When your team has a bunch of money to spend, look how much money the Bears spent on linebackers, you know, this offseason. Tremaine Edmonds, yeah. at like, and they're terrible. So I think it's important to remember – your best way to, you know, to build a quality roster is to draft well and develop. That that is most likely your path to, you know, to success. Like you look at at the Eagles and the 49ers and the majority of their players are draft and develop. Up and down that O-line for the Eagles, up and down that D-line for the 49ers, you know, same with the Chiefs. Look at how good their defense is playing. And they invested all that draft capital. You know, the the, the big money splash they had was Frank Clark, and he never quite worked out. He was good. He was never quite great in what they wanted. You know, and now they've got Karloftis, and they've got, you know, uh, Chris Jones, of course, is the most important part of that. But Bolton and Gay and, like, they're all – those are all draft and develop guys. And I think that's something that Tom and – and and John Spanos and the Chargers subscribe to. That's our best path towards success. Draft, develop, re-sign. If they're not good, you let them walk. Um, and so it's 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 unfortunately an eighty-two and a half million dollar reminder that 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 tends to be the case. But it's it's a reminder. Uh, another on JC. Do you think it was important for this team money, especially at the buy, just to? eliminate the distraction i think first and foremost in the secondary the fact that he was inactive in minnesota active but didn't play uh and just the results were not there uh, it's almost hey you you want that you want that player to become what he was in new england but this kind of clears the deck just see her, you're playing the slot mikey asante this is what we got and you know we don't have to worry about the distraction of whether jc is inactive or active on a weekly basis. Do you think that played into it as well? Yeah, and I think it's important for people to remember it's not just the game. It's practice. You know, what reps is he getting? And if he's not getting the reps that he wants and he's not happy about that and it's clear that he's not going to be playing, then why carry him? Why not get somebody else like Bassey that can come in and get some reps and you hope flashes with the twos or flashes with the scout team and can work his way, you know, into the rotation? So I think that's like, look at Dean Marlowe, right? Like Dean Marlowe gets his opportunity. I'm not going to be surprised if he jumps JT in the rotation. You know, if, if you talk about the depth chart, he played great. Like Dean played really well. And I think that's what we're talking about. You know, you have an opportunity presented to yourself. How do you execute that opportunity? And with JC, I think it was just clear that it wasn't going to happen. Probably wasn't, you know, and, and the injury in his defense, maybe the injury slowed him down and he wasn't 100%. And if that's the case, then okay, just move on. 
You know, just it's yep. it's not happening, and we need somebody right now. This team has to win this year. The team has to win this year. And so I think that's the kind of move. That's that's what that move also signals for me, is that they recognize, okay, we need to get bodies in here because we've got the Cowboys and the Chiefs coming out of this bye, and we at the very least have to split those games and try to win both because now we're back in the division if we win both. We go to Kansas City, we beat them. Now we got a game up on them. So I think that's, that's what it speaks to me as well. It's a good point to, to keep your eye on. I think there's like maybe seven contenders right now. A lot of mediocre teams, buddy. Yeah. A lot of teams that I frankly are competing for that number one overall pick. And it is worth looking at some of these teams at the bottom and, and see what happens in week five. Like you said, if the Broncos lose to the Jets and Zach Wilson on Sunday, maybe that's the signal to say, okay, we, we got to unload some of these contracts. Yeah. Um, it, it, there's there's teams like that, th- you know, kind of littered throughout the NFC and and obviously uh, the AFC too, it just, it seems like there's only like six or seven teams that have kind of raised their hand as Super Bowl contenders at this point, which seems a little low to me uh, based on kind of the parity that we see in the league uh, year in and year out. I don't know. What, what do you think in terms of uh, the contenders in, in both conferences, the AFC, I felt like entering it, it's like okay, this is stacked. We got we got the Bills, we got the Dolphins, right. we got Aaron Rodgers, the Jets. We know what happened there. The Bengals are struggling. Uh, the Steelers are struggling. The AFC South is just two and two. Everybody's kind of middling there. And the AFC West, you know, take the Raiders and Broncos out of it already. To me, it's you know, it's it's early, but I think the the Bills, Dolphins, and Chiefs look. You know, the Bills are back to looking like a buzzsaw. They, they have a really good, really deep defense, and they didn't even have Von Miller for those first four games. He's coming back. So now you got that on the defensive line, you know, to, to go with what you already had. They're so well coached. You know, Josh Allen is just a killer. I mean, he has just got the – I mean, he's got the – his guts are second to none in the league. I mean, that guy will do anything. He yeah. will crawl on his freaking tongue across bro- broken glass to get a first down. And I think you see that all – you know, you're seeing that emerge – so the Bills are certainly a contender. Obviously, I don't need to say anything about the Chiefs. That Miami offense is crazy. You know, the defense has got some issues, but the offense is going to be a mess to, to deal with. A-chain, you know, with another couple touchdowns. You know, you add that to the mix with Tyreek and Jalen Waddell and stuff. So I think they're legitimate. To me, it's, it's those three teams that have separated, you know. And then you start going through it, and it's like, okay, the Cleveland defense is really, really good, but – what's their offense going to be is Deshaun Watson you know he had a nice game last game but then he missed this past game and wasn't really great in the first two prior to that so I think we're still waiting there um like you said the AFC South there's there's good qualities there's bad qualities you you always believe in that Titans defense you know and and if they can just keep it close they're they're a headache because of Derrick Henry and and how he can take the air out of the ball and really wear a team down going into the fourth quarter the Jags are interesting you know they just have not looked good and it felt like they were trending toward being that other team that could join that top tier in the AFC, and that just has not happened. Uh, the Texans are not just frisky. They look – they're interesting. They're really interesting. The way they run the ball, you know, C.J. Stroud has, has had a heck of a start to his career, and obviously D'Amico can coordinate the heck out of a defense. So, you know, I, I think it's those three in the AFC, Chiefs, Bills, Dolphins. I'm not quite a buyer on the Ravens at three and one right now. I, I need to see a little bit more there, you know, especially with all the injuries on defense. And then for the NFC, I, you know, it's it's 49ers to me, and then a gap. I, I think the 49ers are ahead, and then that next year, you know, it's the Eagles, it's the the Cowboys, the Lions are interesting, the Seahawks are interesting. But so Niners, then I would go next tier is Cowboys, Eagles, then next tier is that Lions, Seahawks sort of collection of, of teams. Yeah. The, the Jags are interesting, too, because I think the, the offseason, obviously the comeback win against the Chargers and then keeping it close against right. the Chiefs, I think that kind of masked Trevor Lawrence's first half against the Chargers where he threw for four interceptions, right. and, and people kind of forgot about that. Um, I don't know. That Jags team could very well turn it around. Uh, you mentioned, like, Aiden O'Connell, the, the, the interceptions and the fumbles. C.J. Stroud is doing the complete opposite. He's taking care of the football right. as a rookie quarterback. And and if you can do that in this league, you got a shot every single Sunday. Uh, buddy, let's get back to sure. these questions. Uh, Justin brought 
could we see more Marlowe and Lane lined up at safety to allow Derwin to play near the line of scrimmage more when he comes back? That's that's an interesting thing because you mentioned it, could Marlowe maybe jump JT Woods if if he right. continues to play. This I think way? so because I think they've been looking for that and they need it and they want it because yet yeah, Derwin is just not as effective out there. He's not. That's not what he's best at. Can he do it? Yeah, but <laughs> is it? Is it where you want him? No. You want him near the ball. You want him on the line of scrimmage. You want him jamming a tight end in the slot. You want him rushing the quarterback. You want him run fits. You know, you want, that's where you want Derwin, all over the place near the ball. That's where he excels. Um, and, and JT, you know, you think about that touchdown by Justin Jefferson. He just has had issues, I think, you know, early. In, and it's early. He's a young player, you know. So I think that you got to keep that in mind. He's still getting better. He's still figuring this out. And it's a tough position. But – like I said, you got to win this year. Dean Marlowe's been doing this for seven years. The guy was a starter for a full season. So if he shows that he's adept at the system, that he's comfortable playing all the different coverages that Brandon Staley's calling, and he takes good angles and he makes tackles when they're there to be made, then yeah, I think I think we could see he and Aloe a little bit more moving forward. You know, Raheem's always going to be active on game day because he's such a good special teams player. So if you want to mix him in there, you can, but... Simple answer to that question, yeah. I could I could definitely see him moving up the depth chart and JT sliding back. From our buddy James, uh, I'm posing the same question I did before the season started. With four games in, what is your biggest concern, offense or defense? I'll let you answer this, Bunny, just really quickly for me. I still think it's the defense because you have Justin Herbert on offense. But the offense without Mike Williams, I kind of mentioned it earlier, you don't want to get back – into that same path from last year where you can't get the ball down the field. And I'm looking around, and you hope Jalen Guyton comes back because that's your hope to get some speed on the outside. I don't know when that's going to be, hopefully sooner than later. Um, but they're going to have to figure some things out during this bye week with Corey Lindsley down, with Austin Eckler missing the last three games. Uh, I, I'm very intrigued to see what the offense looks like against the Cowboys with a week to prepare uh, an extra week to prepare during the bye. Uh, defensively, it, it's it's going to be the secondary until they prove otherwise. Um, so, James, that's that's my take on it. Money, what do you yeah. think? Yeah, so I guess I'll be a little bit more specific because we're four games in. So, one, how how is this finger injury going to affect Herbert playing under center, taking snaps under center, yep. negating some play action, and how good that – how big of a boon that's been – um, how much better the running game has been with him under center and Austin Eckler, who I expect will be back against the Cowboys. You know, it made sense for him not to play in the game against the Raiders. Just take the extra two weeks and, and get 100% or close to it as you can. So that's that's one, too, is I thought Will Clapp had a really good game, so I'm fine there um, in terms of Corey. He's, he's not Corey, but, but I thought he played uh, – that he certainly played fine. And uh, Rashawn got bent back on, on a sack – in in the game and that's something I want to keep an eye on because we don't see Rashawn Slater give up four pressures in a game and those weren't four pressures to to Max Crosby you know it was a little bit of Tyree Wilson got one uh, I think it was Divine Diablo um, was opposite him on another and he got bent back and his knee got kind of caught up underneath Justin on a sack from Crosby against Pipkins and so that's something that I think is super concerning because that's sort of what led to a team that did not have a whole lot of pass rush outside of Max Crosby getting quite a bit of pressure on him that entire game. So that's something I'll keep an eye on. Uh, you already said it about they, they need they need a deep threat. Quinton's got to be better. It's just he's just got to play better. You know, it's so so he's so there's that, um, or they have to find somebody else that that can take the top off the defense and catch the ball when it's thrown to him. Um, and then defensively, you know what, Chris? I thought they played really well especially considering like we didn't have a whole lot of explosives, you know, though that we had that 19, we had a third and 19. One of the explosives was that 22 yards from, from Jacobs on the dump off. And that was just a busted coverage. Kenneth was kind of floating on the wrong side of the middle of the field and he was covering nobody. And instead he allowed Jacobs to kind of leak out. That should have been a gain of like six and a punt. Instead it was a gain of 22. And, and obviously Devonte Adams is exceptional, but I thought the secondary did really well. You know, you didn't have a lot of explosive plays in that game, and that's moving forward something they're going to have to continue to be good at. You know, I thought this had an opportunity for, especially without Joey, um, 
you know, with Kendricks just kind of coming back and getting more snaps in this one, not knowing if he was right, you know, with the safeties as the last line of defense, I thought this set up to potentially be a big Josh Jacobs game who has routinely crushed the, the Chargers. And there were no explosive yeah. runs. Thule is exceptional as an edge defender against the run. We know Khalil Mack is great. The interior has been solid. So I think that's encouraging. If they can carry that over to Dallas – and then Kansas City, which is obviously going to be a lot tougher, but I think possible, then, you know, feel a lot better moving forward. Our buddy Dan uh, threw out some defensive rankings through the first four weeks, and one of our thoughts, uh, I'll just go over a few of them. Points per game, 27th in the league. Sacks first. I think Khalil Mack had a big, uh, big say in that. Yards per game through the air, uh, 32nd. And third down conversion, fifth, turnover, seventh. So kind of a mixed bag defensively. Maybe it's something where, you know, you're starting to see the team come together a little bit in that, that 32nd ranking in, in passing defense can change here over the next couple of weeks. Though it will be challenging against the Cowboys. Yeah, so I think it's – I don't want to look at the season stats. I know that sounds like, oh, well, why not? Well, because, you know, the first game of the year was just a wrecking machine. Yeah, yeah, so I think that's, you know, something to remember. I mean, you look at the offensive leaders right now in the league. Tua leads the league in passing yards. Kirk Cousins is third. So that's two of their four games, you know, receiving yards. Justin Jefferson is one. Tyree Kill is three. So, you know, they're facing teams that have explosive offenses and have, you know, the, the Tennessee game was the one real red flag for me, you know, that, that they allowed those explosive plays to Chris Moore and, and, and Traylon Burks, you know, while keeping Derrick Henry in check. And so, you know, when I look at, when I look at the Chargers, I'm kind of looking at, okay, are they getting better? And to me, the last two weeks – where the defense was asked, like, think about this, Chris. The defense could have won the game against Miami and against the Titans, right? They were on the field when the Chargers were leading, and they gave up a score late in the fourth quarter that then had to bring the offense back on the field to try to gain it back. So that's your first two weeks. Your last two weeks, again, the defense is tasked in a much more desperate situation, by the way, the red zone, with coming up with a stop, and they did. So, like, that's... And for whatever you want to say, oh, they got lucky. He's a young quarterback. He didn't see that, that Asante was squatting and knew exactly what play was. Okay, well, yeah, but the defense did that. They executed that. Yeah. Well, Kirk Cousins rushed to the line. He should have called the timeout, but he didn't. And Nick Neiman knew what play was coming, and he let JT know what was coming, and they popped the ball in the air, and they got the interception. So, like, that's a good development. That's progress for the defense. So, in terms of looking at numbers in totality, I would say moving forward, Let's see if these are stepping stones and if they are better against the Cowboys, if they are better against the Chiefs. And if not, let's see them dominate the Bears and the Jets the two weeks after that and and allow the offense to get a couple blowout wins in there. Like that's, I think that's more important moving forward than trying to figure out where they rank through four games because of how crazy that first one was. Money, what did you make of the fourth down call with Justin under center, the quarterback sneak that, that didn't go the Chargers way? So I loved it, and I loved the play call, and I think it was clear that her – you know, I think the question – if you want to question him on that, it's like, hey, clearly his hand was not in a position to be able to run that play. He had kind of pinned that ball way up here because he was worried about fumbling it with his hand and then that caused him to get really tall and what do you want to do you want to get small and you want to get leverage underneath and Herbert's the tallest guy in the pile and it's like yeah that doesn't work you know unless you're going to reach over and maybe that's what the call was like he had at the goal line like hey I'm going to take the snap and I'm going to reach over and when he took the snap he's like I can't do this uh, you know I'm going to fumble the ball if I try to and then he just tucked it against his chest and it's like it was it was doomed to fail but you know we talked to Brandon Staley after every game and I thought he brought up a great point when we asked him about it. He just said, hey, man, I believe in the team. I believe in the call. I just need him to execute it. And I think that's fair. I think it's we've, we've got one of the best quarterbacks in the league, and I am going to put my trust in him to make the play and for the offense to make the play. And if they can't, I trust that my defense is going to make a play. So I'm fine with that answer. And I think I've said this before. I really thought – he got away from his personality. You always want a coach to be genuine, to be authentic. And I think it is in Brandon's, I think it's in Coach Staley's personality to be aggressive, 
to go for these fourth downs. He believes in Justin Herbert, you know, implicitly. And so I think all the media incoming that he took after that Raider game in Week 18 in 2021, I think it affected the way he called the game last year. And I think this year he realizes, you know what, I'm going to do this my way. And I don't. And, and he and he basically said that to us. He's like, I'll take it. I know it's coming. I don't care. I still believe it's the right play for our team in that moment. And I'm going to keep calling it. And I hope he does because I think the team feeds off it. I, I really do. I think it's part of their identity, and they liked having that identity in 2021. And and I would like to see them get back to it to to a little bit of that swagger because um, it does send a belief to both sides. I believe in the offense. You're yeah. going to get me my two feet. And we're going to end this game right here. And you believe in the. And if I don't, I believe in my defense. They're going to do something. They're going to make this work. They need to get a touchdown, and they're going to make sure they don't get in there. So, so I was fine with it. And I know that's not the popular position, but I've said it all along. The defense answered the bell yeah. last two weeks too. You know, two interceptions. Uh, let's get into more of these questions. We got a ton of these. Money. I, I'm going to uh, give you Victor's. Over the bye week, do you guys believe Kellen and Staley will find a way to get QJ more involved in the offense? We've talked about this. Uh, looking at the Raiders specifically as a golden opportunity for Quentin Johnston to, to really get going in his pro career. Uh, it didn't shake out that way. Just one catch. Three targets, but he's on the field for 37 receiving snaps. So he's out there. It's up to him. You know, this is on him now. Like that's, you know, I was talking about it before because he was on the field for eight snaps and then he's only on the field for 12 snaps. And no, he's, he's out there. He's one of the three receivers. And now it's up to him. Get open. And when you get open, catch the ball. And when you start doing that, your quarterback's going to trust you. And he's going to look at you and he's going to throw the ball at you. You know, he had three targets. He caught one. It was a great catch. Had Herbert seen him a little bit earlier on that catch that he made where he had to dive and come back and get it. And it was a great catch. He got his hand under the ball. Um, but had Herbert seen him a little earlier, that could have gone for a touchdown because he flashed open and he was following. And I give him credit. Q was mirroring Herbert and Herbert was just locked a little bit to the right. Had he come back to the middle earlier, he could have hit Q in stride and that might have gone for a touchdown. Um, like we talked about it earlier, the third down drop is inexcusable. You can't do that. You're pinned deep in your own territory. The ball hits you in the chest. You got, first of all, you got to catch that thing. You cannot pin that to your body. And it popped up in the air and could have been an interception. So, and then after that, I think... You know, I don't know. I don't know what's happening, but he's out there. So to me, it's it's not on Staley. It's not on Kellen Moore. It is on Q first, and then it's on Herbert second. You know, it's on Quinton to earn the trust of Justin, and then it's on Justin to have enough trust to throw him the ball. And when he does, he's got to catch it. And that's, and that's how this thing's going to grow. But until that happens, and I think it's important for people, again, I'll, I, I, this is a dead horse I'm beating, but... Remember, these teams practice. They practice. So they know exactly what happens in practice, and that's what they expect to happen in the game. So if Q is getting open, and if he's catching balls in practice, then that's going to carry over to the field on Sunday, or in the case when we come back from the by Monday. So, that's, so to me, it's up to him. This is no longer a what's wrong with Staley, what's wrong with Kellen Moore, why aren't they getting Q the ball? No, Q's got to get the ball. So he's got to make it right moving forward it's on him and I and I and I had a perfect view of it after he dropped that third down pass you know in the first possession of the second half there was a three and out all the way back at their five yard line I was watching him because I wanted to see what his body language looked like he was upset with himself all the receivers are sitting with coach Beatty going over the surface and he kept pounding his chest he was upset and he sat down on a Gatorade cooler by himself and Gerald Everett came over and put his arm around him was trying to encourage him and so he knows, you know, he knows that was a bad play. He knows that was when he left out there. And that when those oper when you're only getting three targets, you got to catch all three. You can't short arm in the end zone. I know the ball was tipped, but his arms got a little short. You can't let a ball pop off your chest on third down. And he made a heck of a play to get that first down, digging that ball out. So just make more of those and, and more targets are going to come your way and more catches are going to come your way. And you're going to pile up some yards in one of these games, get a touchdown, and then we're going to start rolling, you know. But that's... To me, that's what it is. It's not – don't put this on the coach. Don't put this on Kellen. Yeah. Put it on Q. He's, it's now his time. He's getting the opportunity. I appreciate the accountability. Yeah. And when you look at what's ahead, hey, man, 
Dallas Cowboys Monday Night Football at SoFi Stadium. I mean, this is a big opportunity for Quentin to, you know, and I think you're right. It, it starts on the practice 100%. field and, and the trust. And it takes, listen, it, sometimes it takes a while for a quarterback and a wide receiver to trust each other. Um, Justin, we've seen him connect with Guyton and T. Billy. And that's the thing, the Chris. Rip, but like, that's the thing. Like, Justin, I know that he had all those targets to Keenan that day and stuff. And, and that's understandable. He's one of the greatest receivers that's ever played the game. But... We, we've seen that. We've seen Justin throw the ball to Parham, to Guyton, to Tyron Johnson. These are undrafted free agent guys. These are not first-round picks. These are not all pros like Keenan. You know, he's Josh Palmer. He's comfortable. He targeted Josh Palmer like crazy. I mean, he's in tight coverage, and he's trying to throw the ball in tight windows to Josh all game against the Raiders. Yeah. So it's not – Justin doesn't care what your resume reads. You know, he doesn't care what your pedigree is. Get open, I'll throw you the ball, and when I do, catch it. And you're going to get more. And that's, like, think about that fourth down throw. To, it's Donald Parham. He's taken from the XFL, you know, and, and two red zone opportunities, one on a fourth down. And Justin throws him a bullet, a freaking bullet, and he snatches it <laughs> out of the air for a touchdown. You know what I mean? Like, he doesn't care. Justin does not care what your number or the name on the back of your jersey is. So just go out there and earn it. Yeah, no doubt. And if there was any misunderstanding in training camp or at the beginning of the year, there should be no misunderstanding now that Joshua Palmer is clearly wide receiver yeah. two uh, now that Mike Williams is out. And, and Justin has a lot of trust in Joshua. And Joshua earned that trust. He earns it after practice in, in his work ethic and practice. But he earned it last year in, in a bunch of spots when Keenan and Mike no were doubt. down. And he was called on to – help win them football games and you saw it nothing went right in the second half against the Raiders money except for that 51 yard catch to seal the game and ice it yeah uh, so so Joshua I, I feel good about Joshua and his progression uh, we got to see it with Quentin though and he's gonna have a huge opportunity Monday Night Football uh, let's let's stay with the offense um, Bolt fan 24 how significant is Eckler coming back to play next week not only for his abilities with the ball but for pass blocking, I, I think the offense changes dramatically with Austin, 100% Austin Eckler money. Completely. He's one of the best running backs in the league, one of the most complete running backs in the league. Yeah, pass pro has been okay. Um, Josh has, has left a few out there, a couple of those blitzes uh, against Tennessee and, and against uh, Miami. I think he, he kind of missed his assignment a little bit. Um, but it's been okay. It's The difference is that, you know, Austin is such a threat that people don't know what the heck to do with him when he's on the field. It's like, okay, is he going to get the handoff? If he does, I know he never goes down on first contact, and the guy in his career has averaged over four yards per carry, so I've got to be worried about that. If he leaks out in the flat, we know he's going to make the first man miss every time, so that's a headache. Now i got to think about that. And God forbid he goes on a wheel route and he's got a linebacker on him because he's going to torch him, and that thing could go for 50, 60 yards. So it changes everything. You know, you, you now have to account for that player. Where is he? You know, and that's as as good as Joshua's been, uh, you know, as good as I believe Isaiah Spiller can be, that's just not the effect that it has on the defense. When you have a player that when they're on the field, where is he? Where is he and how many resources do we have to commit to him? It it, it has, you know, it, it compounds the ability for the, the offense to be successful. Money, how about the creativity out of Kellen knowing that Austin was down using Darius awesome. Davis on that first drive, that 51-yard pitch and – you know, he accounted, I think, for 56 to the 86 yards on that drive. Uh, we, we talked to Keenan about it after the game. He just said, hey, man, it's, we, we got to get these young guys going. And I thought that that was brilliant. And it, it almost gets the wheels turning when Austin does come back. Why not have Darius and Austin on the field at the same time and, and you know, have some sort of uh, threat to take the ball the distance, have more speed on the field? I think it's, again, let's, let's go back to what we said about practice. Darius is clearly showing stuff in practice, right? They trust him. They love yep. what they see, and I think we're going to see more of that. So to me, it's it's he's earned it. I think he's an interesting weapon, right? And and DJ made a really good point too. Um, he made a really good point with uh, with the Raiders in town yesterday. He's like, hey, don't forget, you know, Justin loved DeAndre Carter. 
Like, DeAndre had a career year last year. The guy had 700 receiving yards. I don't remember how many touchdowns he had. It might have been five. I mean, he had quite a few touchdowns too, though. But, like, Justin went to him on third, critical third downs repeatedly last year. So it's not like Justin needs this tall drink of water as a target. He's totally fine with the smaller guys. And DeAndre is one of the smallest guys in the league. So I think, you know, Darius only had six receiving snaps, um, had two targets, and guess what? He caught them both. So um, caught them both 27 rece- yards after catch. I think we're going to see more of that. I think that's probably something where I could see Justin going into Kellen Moore's office and saying, hey, do me a favor. Go back and look at some of the stuff that DeAndre Carter was doing last year, and let's figure out you know, if we can do that with, with Darius because he's just as fast, if not faster, and the guy catches everything that, that you throw at him. And you know the running replays, I mean, it's guys converted a killer fourth down you know, in Tennessee that led to a score, you know, had that 50, whatever it was, 51 yard run, you know, this last week against the Raiders. Like, I love it, man. I love the creativity. And I, I do think you're going to see him earn more and more snaps moving forward. Yeah. The, the DeAndre Carter thing is, uh, is a great point money. The, the, the trust that, that Justin and DeAndre, they were only together for a year. And for the game in San Francisco, he had the game of his life as a wide receiver, keeping him in it until the end exactly. there on Sunday night football. Uh, Let's take a quick break. We'll get some more of your questions. A big thank you to our partner, Microsoft Surface, the official sideline technology provider and laptop of the NFL and the Los Angeles Chargers that provides players and coaches with the tools to succeed both on and off the field. Check out the powerful Surface Pro 9, combining the power of a laptop with the flexibility of a tablet at Surface.com. All right, Money, so a lot of questions involving the name Kyle Pitts. I'm just going to read one of them. Cody Ray Thompson, should the Chargers sniff around Kyle Pitts to see if there is a trade possibility there? You mentioned Chase Claypool, too, at the top. I I think fans are wondering what they can do offensively, specifically on the outside or or a weapon as a tight end. You know, I I thought Gerald was going to have a bigger game, frankly, against against Vegas. Uh, That didn't turn out. But is is Kyle Pitts a name that interests you? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I don't know what it would cost. And, you know, he's coming up at the end of his... Here's the thing. The Chargers have a lot of veteran contracts right now. They want more rookie contracts. So I think if they're trading Mm -hmm. for a player, it's probably going to be somebody that... Like last year, I thought they should have traded for Hawkinson. Like to me, that's... You know what? This is exactly what you want a tight end to be in the NFL. You know what you're... Yes, it's going to cost you some money, but that problem is solved. He's great in line blocking. He is a great receiver, and he's proven it. You know, he's great in the red zone. So and it's going to cost you a second. Kyle, for whatever reason, uh, has just not flashed. It just hasn't happened. And I think some of that could be quarterback. Some of that could be Arthur Smith likes to run the heck out of the ball. Uh, are those opportunities there? So, look, if you can get him for a steal, sure. I got no problem with that, but I just don't know if they're ready to give up on a guy that they drafted in the top five for, you know, for a flyer, you know, for someone that, oh, yeah, we'll give you a fourth, you know, I I just don't quite know, you know, and the nice thing is you have the fifth year option, so you pick that up. I'm not quite sure where, see if I can find, um, let's see where he is in his contract. My apologies, folks, but as you're looking for money, Johnny Smith is outplaying right. him on the roster, you know? So that, that's just a little curious. But I, I do wonder, the, the quarterback situation in Atlanta, how much that is affecting Kyle Pitts and how different it may look with Justin Herbert throwing him the football. Uh, 100%. Ha- having a, a top-five guy getting you the ball as opposed to Desmond Ritter, who uh, clearly is in his second year in, in a run-heavy offense. So he's cheap. Here's the great thing, right? Um He's, he's going to cost you he's, – he's on the books for $3.6 million this year, and you're talking about, you know, two-thirds of that. And then next year he's on the books for 5.1. You pick up the 50-year option. I mean, that's nothing for a tight end. So, yeah, there, there you go. Now that I've looked at it, my answer is yes. I, I would like that. I would Because I still, as someone who follows college football and keeps tabs on college football, he's one of the freaks, absolute freaks of nature that we've ever seen at the position. And so, yeah, I would be all for that. And again, it goes to this team's got to win this year. 
this team has to win this year. Yeah. So go get it. Staying with that theme, uh, our buddy Brian Rick uh, talking about the cap space that the Chargers have now that J.C. Jackson has been traded in, in the spendable cap. What position groups would you target right now? If, if, if I said, Money, uh, give me your top three position groups that the Chargers need to address uh, during the season, whether it's trade or, or you know, a guy who's out there in free agency, uh, what positions would you target? Well, I think it's, it's probably – you know, it's it's probably secondary. I think is is what we're looking at. Um, so much of it's going to revolve around what this roster looks like next year. You know, they pushed money. You know, they they pushed money down the road for Bosa, for Keenan. You know, for Mike. So I don't know what that looks like at, at those positions. But it goes back to the conversation I was having about about JC. You know, there's a reason why guys become free agents. You know, they, they get too expensive for their current teams and, and how they value them. And they figure, well, we know them better than anybody else, and we're just not going to pay that. That's, that, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't even up for us. And, and I'm not saying that all free agents are bad. They're not. I mean, we've seen free agents have huge impacts on teams, you know. So I'm not suggesting you don't go out and spend zero dollars. But I think what you're talking about originally, you know, making trades. Can you trade for players and use those draft picks for someone who has cost certainty for two and a half more years like Kyle Pitts? You get the half of this season, you get all of next season, and then a fifth-year option for the season after that. Like, that makes sense to me. You know, that's kind of what I'm – that's sort of like what I'm getting at. Like, if I go to the Broncos right now, it's, it's a little bit of a different deal for, for Justin Simmons because he's already on that, that – free agent vet contract right the guy's making 14 million bucks this year he's making 14.5 million bucks next year and then he becomes an unrestricted free agent I don't think that's something as much as I'd like to see him and I think he'd be a big help for the Chargers I just sorry about the lawn lawn care outside it never fails like anytime I Fine. do this pod for whatever reason but then I go and <laughs> and I look at someone like like Patrick Sertan and you break down his current contract situation and you got 3.5 million bucks on the books next year and then you get the fifth year option so you get a year and a half of cough certainty before you got to pay him like that's one that makes more sense for this team to get this year and next year you know and the following year so you get all of, he's he's in the exact same boat as Kyle Pitts so you get the rest of 2023 at 2.5 million you get 2024 at 3.5 million and then you get 2025 on the fifth year option so like those are the guys that I think make sense to trade valuable picks for for this team that's ready to win right now well said uh we'll keep it going with chris g do you guys think guyton and abonia are back against the cowboys and how do you think they make room mm. for those two on the roster when they do return you know getting tito back is going to be a big deal for this defensive line uh jalen guyton obviously too if if he can come back and and flash that speed that he had pre-injury then we're talking about another weapon on the outside. Yeah, I think when you look at the the D line, um, you know they just waived Hinton in order to bring in Bassey, so that's that's one spot that you know is gone. Nick Williams has played well. Um, I could, jeez, oh, what do you do? So you got obviously Austin and, and and Bash and and Nick Williams are your kind of three rotational guys inside. You bring Tito into the mix and. I'm going to combine a question. Yeah. Someone asked about Matlock in, in his performance through the first quarter of the season. Yeah, he's too. depth. You know, Matt, he, that's a development piece. You're talking about a guy that was drafted in the, the sixth round, I think, is, is where Scott was, was drafted. So, you know, I think it's, it's probably um, – let me see. I'm trying to figure out where – oh, see, there you go. I'm looking at the wrong thing. Um, so here we go. You got – Bash, Morgan Fox, Hinton, who just got waived, um, Nick Williams, Johnson, Matlock. Um, boy, I don't know where they make room for him. I don't know if Tanner Muse gets waived uh, just to make room there. I guess I could kind of see that maybe. Um, that would probably be the one that that makes the most. I mean, obviously, A.J. Finley's going to go down when, when Gilman gets back and J.T. So, yeah, I think probably Tanner Muse. Might be the guy that 
that makes room. And and then obviously, you know, you had Keelan Doss up. He was reverted back to the practice squad. But, you know, he'll take he'll take one of those spots there. Yeah. Uh, your thoughts on the Cowboys and Chiefs being scheduled on six-day rest coming out of the bye week. This is from Alexis. So, Chargers have the Cowboys. Yeah. Monday Night Football. Short week. Got to go to Kansas City. Yeah, I think it stinks. It's, you know, it's just kind of been whatever. Every year it seems like we're on the road for Thursday night football in Kansas City, seemingly on a short week. Um, you know, I think you look at the Chiefs and, you know, they get the, they, they've got Denver on Thursday night football. So not only are the Chargers on a short week from Monday to Sunday, but the Chiefs are playing the Broncos the previous Thursday night. So they've got a mini buy when the Chargers got a short week. It stinks. You know, it stinks. But, uh, it is what it is. You can't change the schedule. And I think more importantly than being on short rest is hoping that the, the refs don't swallow their stinking flags every time the, the offensive line holds. You know, finally, and, and you credit NBC for doing it, you know, they, they got Jawan Taylor exposed. And he can't play. Like they, they, it's like they can't play him. He's got to figure it out. He has got to line up where he's supposed to line up, and he cannot jump the snap count because there's a magnifying glass on him now. So I'm glad to see that ironed out. We've said it here before, but you want to know why Joey Bosa was losing his mind in Jacksonville? It's because that's what he was doing, and it was driving him crazy. And that's why he freaked out on the referees over and over again because the guy was getting to set up three yards back of, of where Bose is rushing, and, and it's just a, a huge advantage. So that's one, too. You look at the Patrick Mahomes run, and I know the clip has made its way all over social media, as it should. And, I mean, Johnson is getting held the entire time right in front of a referee, and they never throw the flag. And that has always been my contention with the Chiefs, is their offensive line holds on every single play. And they just operate under the philosophy of, they can't throw the flag on every play. They can't throw the flag on every third play. They can't throw the flag on every fifth drop back. So you know what? We're just going to keep holding, and we'll take our hits here and there, but we don't care. And that's – and look, I give them credit. It works. They, it's, it's a philosophy that has clearly worked for them, but it's infuriating for opponents because, you know, when you're Bosa or Mac or Thule and you're getting held – and that's the only reason why you can't get to Mahomes, and that's when he's at his best, when he's freelancing and extending the plays. It's it, it can get upsetting, and so that's you know that's that's more of an issue to me than the six days. Throw the flags if there's a hold on every play. Throw the flag if Shaq gets fouled every time he's underneath the basket. Blow the whistle and send him to the free throw line blow until teams stop fouling him. And that's just something I've always subscribed to. Guys, we appreciate your questions. We got time for a few more. Uh, Blue Goat, at the beginning of the year, we thought the bye week came at a bad spot. Now that the season is underway, how do you think differently of the week five bye? And how do you think, guys, th uh, how do you guys think the week six to 17 stretch will play out? So now it's good. Hopefully, you get as many guys back as possible right. money going into Monday Night Football. But now the bye week's gone, and you hope that this team can stay healthy to to a point I, everyone's gonna have injuries from weeks one to 17 uh or 18 now i guess but i, I just i i hope that this team can sustain some semblance of health from the cowboys game all the way to week so 18. here's what i would say to that and this is this and this could actually go back to an earlier question right about you know now that you're four games in what are your concerns like they got to start blowing teams out they should have blown the Raiders out. Yeah. And that way you can pull Rashawn out of that game in the fourth quarter and you can put Foster Sorrell in. If his knee's not right, let's get Rashawn out. Let's get Keenan out. Let's get Khalil Mack out. Let's get Austin and Bash. And let's get those guys out of the game because you're up 25, 30 points with eight minutes to go. You got the Bears, the Jets. The Lions are a very good team. But after that, you're at Green Bay. You get Baltimore at home. You're at New England, Denver at home, at Vegas. Look at that stretch. In that stretch, you've got the Bears, the Jets, the Packers, the Patriots, the Broncos, and the Raiders. Let's, if this team is truly a Super Bowl contender, get blowouts in four of those games, and that's your bye. Can we see a that's blowout? What I mean. We haven't seen a blowout since New yeah, Year's Day. Like, let's get a blowout, and let's rest some guys. And that way, that's your bye, right? You didn't have to play 65 snaps. You only had to play 40. 
That's that's how you get your buy, and it's it's an opportunity for you to get guys some rest, you know, and not have to to, to play until zeros in the fourth quarter. So that would be the way I would hope to to negotiate not having a buy, you know, for the remaining for the remaining um, thirteen games. Uh, our buddy Athir, he he asked about the offense. I think we answered that question. Um, the the game plan versus Dallas. Somebody asked. You know what I remember last year, the team, it, the the team coming off playing the Forty ers always right. lost because they got beat right. up. Right, and and the Cowboys have the Forty ers Sunday night football before they play the Chargers. I'll be able to get an extra day. Uh, but but the game plan against this Dallas Cowboys team, both offensively and defensively, money. What do you think? Well, it's limit explosives. It's you know it's a, look it's a very good offense. It's a it's a really good offense. You have to account for Tony Pollard. You have to account for Ceedee Lamb. Michael Gallup's got speed. So I think it's limit the explosives. To me, it's it starts with the run game though. They they want to be, you know they they want to run the ball. They they want Tony Pollard to to do damage, and so I think that's where I start. You know, he's got two rushing touchdowns this year. He's averaging four and a half per carry. Um, so I start there. I, I think in terms of Dak, he's taking care of the football this year. You know, he's completing seventy one percent of his passes as I'm looking at the numbers. And and you know, C D Lamb is he's got some explosives. He's got what seven explosives already. So you want to control those. Um, I think that's. I know it sounds simple, you know, and, and look, there's like against the Raiders, there were two people you had to worry about, right? Devontae Adams and Max Crosby. And for the most part, they committed the resources they needed to. Uh, a f- the few times that Max Crosby was left one-on-one, one time was the Trey Pipkins rush that he just wrecked him, sacked Justin, and that's the one that got pushed into Rashawn Slater and bent his knee back. Like, that's all you have to do. So like, to me, that's, so here you go. I'm talking in, not in platitudes, but in a little bit more generality. So here's my specific plan. Do not let C.D. Lamb and do not let M- Micah Parsons beat you. I know that's easier said than done, but at the very least, commit the resources where you have to. Micah Parsons should have zero one-on-one rushes. Zero. And C.D. Lamb should have zero one-on-one opportunities. Do to him what you did to Justin Jefferson for most of the game. Double the heck out of him, double the heck out of Micah, and take your chances everywhere else. Freaking Max Crosby, man. Did you see the Baldy breakdown of, of he's Crosby incredible. last Sunday? Yeah, he's incredible. Uh, Micah Parsons coming to town. I, I, I think you need to, to account for him with three yeah. guys. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, A couple more. Uh, What do you make of Murray wearing the dot Sunday? More about him improving at linebacker or easing Kendricks' plate. Also, if you guys have thoughts on Justin's finger and uh, chance of aggravation as it heals, love the pod. Go Chargers from Sandusky, Ohio. Jake Nelson. Not a doctor. I don't mean to be smug or or snarky about that, but I just hate doing the the diagnosis thing. So I truly don't know uh, about the finger. The only thing I'll say, Jake, is that we know how tough that guy is and that he will play through anything. <laughs> so whatever it is, he's going to play through it, and, and they'll adjust. You know, I think you saw that toward the end of the game, a lot of shotgun, and, and to me that means you're probably going to have to play a lot of pistol so you can at least still have a little bit of play action, a lot more RPOs. Um, what was the other part of his question? The finger and the... Uh, okay. Kenneth oh. Murray's progression and wearing yeah, the green dot. I think he did a great job with it. So why not? Why not have the guy that's been in the offense for four years, you know, three plus years, wear the green dot if he's comfortable with all the calls? Um, I have no problem with him keeping the green dot moving forward. Antonio, what are your opinions on why QJ's usage has been so limited? You answered that. Uh, but uh, greetings from Sao Paulo, Brazil. So shout out to Antonio listening to us from Brazil. That's awesome. Um, you know, the, a couple of Claypool questions, too. Would you take a flyer on Claypool? Let's say he gets released. This would be his third team. I think little margin for error for Chase Claypool wherever he goes next. It's a it's kind of a boomer bust signing if that were to happen. Yeah, Chris, I'll, I'll equate it to the, the Rams from two years ago when they picked up Odell Beckham, and there was a lot of whining and, and him and hawing about, why would you do that? This is a team that's on a track for a Super Bowl because they can just cut him. Let's see what it, he's a talented player. Let's see what he can do. If it's not great, we'll cut him after a week. If it's great for a week, we'll cut him after two weeks. Like that's 
So, like, to me, that's the thing with, with, with Claypool. Now, the one red flag for me is Pittsburgh's done a great job with wide receivers. They draft, they develop, and they turn wide receivers into premier players. So the fact that they gave up on Claypool was a little bit interesting. You know, it, it tends to be a locker room that's super strong, and, and you really kind of got to be a bit of an issue to not fit in in that particular locker room. So that would be the one red flag. But I think there's just – there's so little – yeah, there's so little investment or equity that you have to put into it that it'd be super easy to just move on if it didn't work out. Last question, Money. This is from uh, Junius Lim. Should there be any major concerns with the lack of production from special teams, especially the play of JK, or does Ficken turn this around? He says, not a sexy topic, but something other than JC Jackson. Sure. I think this last week was a terrible special teams week, right? You know, I mean, it, save Dicker, but like you have... Darius Davis, who I think fumbled, if I remember right, he fumbled a, a punt out of bounds, but still, you know, ended up booting one out of bounds. You had, um, you know, you had JK, whose issues showed up again from the first half of Minnesota. I think it was a 22-yard punt and like a 31-yard punt when they really needed him to flip the field. Uh, I thought his punt out of the end zone was really good. He got it past the 50. So when he had no, no room to operate, so that was a good one. But yeah, that's all stuff that can be fixed because you know what? It was great last year. It's something we said at the top of the show, right? We've seen it be exceptional. We've seen all these players play great. We've seen Darius Davis return a punt 81 yards for a touchdown you know, in the preseason. We've seen him return a punt for 25 yards already. So we know those, that greatness is there. Um, so yeah, I suspect that, that they'll get it right. I think Coach Fick, Ficken is exceptional. Yeah. I think his units tend to be some of the best in the league. So the buy is probably a good opportunity for them to kind of dig into to see what's going on with JK and, and, and why he's got a little bit of the, you know, whatever you want to call him in golf. It's the, the shanks or the yips or whatever. But we know he can do it because he did it for an entire season last year. Like I said, the guy was incredible last year. So I suspect they'll come back against Dallas and, and, be, and they better be, by the way, because our friend Turpin's over there return and punt. So let's make sure uh, we get this thing right <laughs> before uh, Cavante shows up at SoFi on a Monday night. Yeah, that guy's a problem. Uh, another yeah. TCU uh, wide receiver. All right, all right Muddy, what are you looking forward to on Sunday? Chargers aren't playing, but uh, some decent games. I guess we talked about San Francisco, Dallas. Kansas City has Minnesota. Right. Vegas, Packers. Let's see. What am I looking forward to? I agree with you. I think Denver Jets is very intriguing to see most definitely. Uh, how Denver treats the rest of the season. You know what? I'll tell you what's super interesting. It's Bengals Cardinals. That's because the Cardinals have played their tails off this year, and the Bengals have looked terrible. Like Joe Burrow statistically has been the worst quarterback in the league, which is crazy to think, right? Mm. So they go one and four, and man, that's that's going to get sideways in a hurry. Obviously, the the Sunday nighter is incredible. Cowboys 49ers is going to be, you know, must watch for me. But yeah, let's go Vikings. Let's see if Kirk Cousins can can light it up a little bit, and if Patrick Mahomes can struggle like he did uh, against you know against the Jets, if they can get some stuff going there. Although that secondary is terrible, I expect him to make a you know to humiliate Byron Murphy. Um, Rams Eagles is interesting. You know, the return of uh, Rams are Rams are spunky. I did not think that they were going to be good this year. And, you know, Aaron Donald had a monster game last week against Indy. Uh, they almost, you know, gave that one away up. What was it? 23, nothing. Uh, so that's a good one. I think I'm giving you way too much information. You just wanted a simple answer. So there you go. That's good. Uh, Puka Nakua. Who yeah. would have thunk it? Yeah, right. This awesome. Guy's, it's unbelievable. All right, guys. Uh, hey, appreciate the questions. Uh, Always 100%. appreciate you guys watching, listening. If you're listening, we post Thursday's Chargers Podcast Network. If you're watching, uh, YouTube's on Friday. Um, so thanks for watching, guys. For Money, I'm Chris. This has been Chargers Weekly. Chargers Weekly.